everything that we do in the conservation department and all of the research that we do is to make sure that that collection remains stable for as long as possible so that people can come to the museum and immerse themselves in Tudor life. These statistical ecologists have spent years passionately developing advanced mathematical models that are now being used in the field to map and manage butterfly populations across the world. I've been working for, well, seven years or so on a, a fascinating publication called The Ladies Magazine, a hugely popular uh, monthly magazine for women. I would certainly argue the first recognisably modern women's magazine. We're working together with the uh, uh, University of Kent and other uh, partners to really make it a real, you know, real vaccine that you can use, you know, the, the product is right here and not just in papers. Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth and penultimate instalment in our Next Generation Impact series, where we've been talking about all aspects of the impact agenda. Today's event is entitled Maximising Impact, Engaging the Public with Research. Why does engaging the, with the public matter and how can it be tied to the University of Kent's civic mission? Also, how can it lead directly to impact? Our panellists today are professors Catherine Richardson, Alex Stevens and Mark Connolly, and we'll be finding out how and why they engage with the public in their research. If you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, you can also join in the discussions by sending any questions or comments in the live chat sidebars on whichever stream you're watching on. We'll then put them to our panellists. You can also tweet your questions and comments using the hashtag NextGenerationImpact. So, let's make a start. Catherine, let's come to you first. Tell us a little bit about your area of research and some of the ways in which you engage with the public. Hi, thanks, Darren. OK, so uh, I want to take you back about 400 years. I work on the material culture and the lived experience of early modern England. So what it felt like to be an ordinary person living an ordinary life in the reigns of Queen Elizabeth and uh, King James. Uh, what, what house you would have lived in, what you would have worn, what you did for entertainment or work, what happened in the streets, for instance. So that's one part of my job. And the other part of my job is as director of the uh, Institute of Cultural and Creative Industries at Kent. And as part of that job, I find ways of bringing um, the research we do around cultural and creative practices at the university to the public. So lots of things we do with the public, uh, stage plays, putting on performances, but also schools work uh, and working in the uh, galleries, libraries, uh, archives and museums sector. So those are just some of the things. Hope we'll come back to some of them later. 400 years, beautifully succinct there. Thank you very much. Um, Alex, let's come to you. You're from a completely different field. Would you give us a brief overview of your research area? Sure. Well, well, I'm Professor in Criminal Justice here at the University of Kent at our Medway campus, and I specialise in researching the overlap between drugs, crime and public health, including um, looking at the public health crisis that's going on at the moment with drug-related deaths that are at the highest ever level in the UK. And I've also been working in the past on issues of youth crime, and obviously that's a big issue of, of concern at the moment with um, numbers of teenage murders. Um, that are very concerning indeed. And so it's very important in my work to involve people who are directly affected. So the parts of the public that are most involved, i.e. young people themselves <clears throat> who are highly victimised, as are people who use drugs, very often victimised by crime, but also very vulnerable to deaths. And so we need to work with these groups directly to help them to reduce those risks, to help us find out how best to reduce some of these problems they face. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Mark, you explore a very different historical area to Catherine. Uh, same question to you. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your area of research? Yeah, um, around my research, I'm head of the School of History, so that, that takes up a big uh, part of my time. But I am also the principal investigator for the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project Gateways to the First World War, which I think we'll come back to um, in a bit. And, and that reflects my key research interests. I'm a historian of the Great War, particularly of the uh, British Empire's contribution to the Great War. And if you want to drill down to it even um, you know, more um, 
uh, deeply than that. Um, really, what, what I look at is the way the war was commemorated in Britain and the Empire, and particularly interested in the work of what was then called the Imperial War Graves Commission, and now the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And I try and integrate um, all of that um, you know, research interest into the stuff I do with students and uh, to engaging the wider public. Fantastic. So I'm going to stay with you, Mark. Uh, why is public engagement so important to your research? One to me because you know I'm uh, it, it kind of comes from my heart and my head as it were. You know, I'm involved in something that is so emotive um, as a subject, you know, be, because it, it's about mass death and, and trauma, and that's something that um, you know clearly uh, has an overlap with lots of people's family histories, their sense of of, of their selves. So I feel it's it's kind of in. Um, a, a debt that I have really to engage with the wider community but where it becomes reciprocal is the fact that you know if I um, can engage with, with a broader public they can also bring their knowledge their interests into my work um you know be, because often um because i'm involved in, in such minutiae you know of people's lives um in the early part of the 20th century that's where engaging with the public is fantastic you know because people come in and they say well i've got this in in the attic or you know we've had this sitting around in a drawer for years um can you tell us a little bit about it so i might be able to provide a bit of context but they're also it, you know, showing me um, priceless stories about the past so that we are involved in, in a constant dialogue, a constant discussion, refining our understandings of the past, you know, and building more history. You know, history is a constantly evolving subject. So I think that that sense of a, an ongoing uh, relationship is absolutely crucial to my work. Alex, uh, how can public engagement act for a, as a vehicle for change? Well, that's a really interesting question because it drives to what public engagement is for. Um, and as researchers, as academics, we want to change the world, but we shouldn't be so arrogant to think that we have all the answers. So I think there are you know, two broad areas of reasons why we get involved in public engagement. One is instrumental and the other is ethical instrumentally um, involving the public in our research and specifically subsections of the publics that are the most directly relate, relevant to that research. It improves the quality of our research. We get better research findings if we involve the public in creating those research findings with us. It also increases the likelihood that that research will have impact. Um, for research to have impact, it needs to be salient, it needs to be credible, and it needs to be legitimate. We need to involve, produce it in ways that people think is open, transparent, and fair to their needs. So we need to increase that legitimacy of research by involving the public in it. Those are the instrumental reasons, but there are also ethical reasons. I think, especially in my fields around um, researching with young know, people or researching with people who use drugs, we should try and avoid going into communities and just extracting the information and taking it away for our own purposes. We don't want to be doing data mining and using people's bodies and, and lives just as things to advance our careers with, you, it should be, as you say, something that changed the world for them rather than just for us. And in order to do that, we have to work alongside and with those communities, not just on them. And staying with you, Alex, um, can you give us some examples of success stories that you've either worked on or perhaps you've heard about when the public have been directly involved in research? I'll start with one that um, our, we're very proud of in, here in Kent Law School, for example, with Helen Carr and Ed Curtin Darling's work on fire safety. Now, this obviously became a hugely salient issue um, after the Grenfell disaster. Um, and Helen and, and Ed have been working for a number of years with community groups such as Tower Blocks UK that work on fire safety. And so in collaboration with those community groups, they've been able to come up with fire safety checklists that have been taken to Parliament and acted on. And now this, that's in, that information is spread that has been jointly produced by academics and community members on how to improve the safety of people who are living in tower blocks, which is such an important issue. In my own research, um, we're increasingly involved in projects such as the evaluation we're currently doing with our partners at Tonic for the Ministry of Justice of its prison lever pro projects. 
Now we won, um, with Tonic, we won a million pound contract from the Ministry of Justice um, to evaluate their attempts to improve the transition from custody to community for people leaving prison. And we feel it's incredibly important that um, not only is the experience of people leaving prison taken seriously when designing those interventions, as the Ministry of Justice are attempting to do by involving people with that experience in the design of these interventions. Also, we feel it's important that people with lived experience of leaving prison should be involved in the evaluation. And so we're employing people who've got that direct experience in the evaluation of the Prison Leavers Project to do what I just said, to improve the quality, the impact, but also the ethicality of that research. Okay. So, Catherine, we've just heard some amazing success stories there. Uh, why do you think public engagement with research matters, um, and specifically both for the public and for us as academics? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, um, as far as I'm concerned, as someone who works on uh, the history of our communities, um, this is our history, all of our histories. It's our culture, it's our heritage, um, and we need to be working out what we want to know about that together. So that's a kind of joint endeavour, if you like. Um, I want to know from schools groups what they want to find out about the past, how they want to determine what history looks like, and the kind of questions that we're asking. So for instance, um, uh, not very many decades ago, we didn't know anything about the groups I work on, and those are the groups in the broad centre of society. We knew something about uh, the elite, the very, very wealthy people, and we knew a little bit about the poor, but we knew nothing about the people in the middle. And that's where most of us are socially today. So I think, you know, it's about defining what we want to know about the past together and then finding out about it. It's also about people's local communities. So, uh, for instance, at the moment I'm working on uh, William Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, and those were people from provincial towns uh, whose whose parents were craftspeople. Uh, they're local people in local schools, and so there's a local history there that matters to those communities. But both of those people went on to have national and international lives through the work that they produced. So I think. Um, that, that makes it, again, all of our histories, and it, it helps all of us to be involved in that process of finding out more ourselves. But also, I mean, just thinking about those questions about social change uh, that Alex was talking about, coming at that from a very different perspective, what we're trying to understand about these middling groups at the moment is how their acquisition of skills, how their literacy, for instance, help them in their social mobility. So if we want to understand social mobility nowadays, if we want to see that as a trajectory from where we are now to where we want to be as a society in the future, we also need to know where we were in the past. So it's about understanding our history in order to uh, help to shape our future. And that, again, matters to all of us. And um, knowing more about it will help all of us, both in, in uh, at universities uh, and in communities that they serve. Thanks. Well, uh, staying with you then, Catherine, um, we at the University of Kent, we've got a civic mission. And uh, one of the things that an awful lot of people like to know is to what extent uh, is or indeed should public engagement be tied to that mission? I suppose I've sort of answered, started to answer that question by answering the previous one, I guess. Um, you know, this is our civic mission here uh, at the University of Kent uh, is partly a regional civic mission and partly a local civic mission. And, you know, some of the work that we're doing, for instance, around the Institute of Cultural and Creative Industries is working with Medway uh, Council on their cultural strategy. Um, and we're thinking about how our research and how our expertise can help to shape that cultural strategy. But we're also doing a lot of listening um, uh, to what Medway wants its cultural strategy to be. So um, I think it's really, really important. We can help to inform all the various groups that are involved in work like that cultural strategy. Um, we can help them to find out more about their history as a group, um, but we can also be involved in what's happening in the present. So uh, a lot of the work um, that we're doing around the Creative Estuary Project, for instance, and the Estuary Festival, that's about really celebrating creativity in our local communities. Um, and that's, that's a vital part of our civic mission as a university, I think, to be really uh, bringing all the expertise and, and the uh, facilities that we've got as a university to bear to the support of our of our local communities and, and helping to um, 
listen to what they need in order to get their community to where it wants to be. Excellent. Uh, now, Mark, you uh, have been engaging with a number of stakeholders, and I, I have a list here. Uh, the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, the Heritage Lottery Fund, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and that's just a few of them. Um, why do you think it's so important to collaborate with these stakeholders, and, and how does it benefit the public? Well, I, I think the you know the, the degree of collaboration is absolutely crucial for for a start. You know, from us um, coming from our position as academics, it's hugely useful to engage with bodies whose entire focus, you know, their raison d'être is is outreach and engagement and thinking uh, about the needs and interests of a really broad range of of people and, and groups. So. It's it's hugely uh, helpful. It's, it's absolutely fascinating to work with partners like that because, in some ways, you know what you might uh, say is it, it stops you having to invent the wheel yourself. You know because they have their expertise, um, and and that's a lovely thing. It's about the interlockings of, of different expertise, you know, uh, and, and um, different sets of um experiences so working with partners um yeah I, I found really really valuable um there is uh, it, it then feeds back in because it starts to make i think us as academics reflect on the way we go about our research projects the kind of research questions that we ask because it, it helps us think about a wider group of end users um and, and for me you know working with big national and international bodies like that um, has been a, a hugely fruitful and, and valuable process. Alex, a personal question for you. Uh, what do you find the most rewarding about doing public engagement? It makes, well, it gives meaning to the research that I do. Um, if I were just a person who was you know, stuck in an office um, reading books, writing articles on repeat, I wouldn't see much point to that existence. Um, the reason I became an academic is because I was curious, interested, and to be honest, angry about some of the things that are happening in the world. And it's only through engaging in the public that I feel that I make the research that I create meaningful to people outside universities, which is, I think, what drives many of us to do the research that we do. So we have a number of esteemed panellists on the line, of course, but we've also been speaking to Director of Engagement, Dr. Philip Pothan, and Dr. Eleni Matechu from the School of Mathematics, Statistics and Actuarial Science, and they've been giving their thoughts on public engagement. public engagement and civic mission, to my mind, speak of a university's place within their community. Uh, it speaks of their commitment to that community and of a university's contribution to the health, well-being, prosperity of uh, that community. I suppose if I had to point to one difference between the two, it would be that civic mission speaks more to that uh, local focus. Uh, I think Civic Mission perhaps uh, has a focus on local authorities, NHS trusts, schools, colleges within the university's remit. Public engagement can go broader, it can be very much about national uh, uh, a remit for uh, engagement or an international focus as well. I don't think there's any contradiction between local and global engagement. It's often thought of as a, as a trade-off between the two. I think if one thinks perhaps of the old adage around sustainability in the environment, think global, act local. I think that's very much uh, how I would see the linkage between global and civic mission. I think the two are inextricably entwined. I think one can think of one's campus as being uh, a, 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 with a global focus. We have um, students and staff from many nationalities around the world. Um, 
That's, in a sense, the world on our campus. Equally, we prepare our students and staff to go out into the world and to, um, and to do their, their work, to become uh, alumni of the university, perhaps, uh, and so on. So I think the, the two are inextricably tied. I think one also ought to think about the national picture when one is thinking about global and local. I think that the, the, the three things can, can weave very nicely and creatively um, together. I think there are a number of ways that civic mission can impact on communities um, through the work of widely participation and outreach, for example, through public engagement with research, uh, through our open campuses that invite our communities onto our campus and, and uh, the offer that we take out to our communities is through volunteering and so on. I think underpinning all of those is some notion of dialogue, of listening, of two-way conversations and I think that that should really underpin um, what we do in all of those spheres. Um, and I think we need to be responsive to those the needs of our community. We need very much the conversation to begin with, what can we, the university, do for you, our community? And I think that should be the, the strand, uh, the golden thread uh, that goes through all of our engagement activities and all of the impact that we hopefully will make on our communities. My name is Dr. Eleni Matejo. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in statistics um, and I'm a member of the um, research group called Statistical Ecology um, at Kent. Um, so I, as part of my research, I work with um, so-called citizen science or um, community science data. So these are data sets collected by the public um, in a volunteer um, role. Um, so, for example, uh, volunteers take part in um, surveys aiming to um, monitor bumblebees, butterflies, birds, um, and the volunteers or the public um, take um, regular surveys where they walk along pre-specified paths and they record what they see. So, for example, um, uh, as part of the Bee Walk, uh, which is the only UK-based uh, citizen science scheme specifically targeting uh, bumblebees, uh, the public walk along the transects, as these paths are called, and they record, um, uh, they count the bumblebees that they see and uh, record their um, species and cast. Um, and what we do then is um, we build uh, the necessary statistical models to make sense of that data uh, so that we can estimate important demographic parameters. So, uh, for example, population trends um, are, are the uh, bumblebees, the bumblebee numbers going up or are they, are they going down? Uh, are these trends um, different across different parts of the country? Um, are they linked to certain environmental con conditions and so on? Um, working with the public in this format has been um, obviously hugely beneficial for us, um, not just um, us as researchers, but also the charities uh, and organisations who are um interested um in the kind of ecological processes uh and that's because the um the, the public as i said are volunteers so they volunteer their time and their effort and they collect really rich um large scale and long-term data sets that help us um, answer important ecological questions and this would not have been possible uh if we were relying on professionals uh, to do these surveys because of the corresponding time and cost um, implications. Um, <clears throat> so these uh, large scale, long term and very rich data sets have also required us to uh, 
uh, to build novel statistical models. And of course, as statisticians, this is exactly what we love doing. Uh, we love a new problem, a new challenge that requires novel uh, statistical models. Um, and as more and more volunteers take part in these uh, schemes, um, the challenge of modeling the data becomes greater and hence more, more, um, more interesting. Um, the, the results um, that we obtain, so in collaboration with the organizations who um, manage these citizen science uh, surveys, uh, are often uh, used to inform um, sort of policies and decision making um, because they refer to the, to the state, for example, for pollinators in the UK or other important uh, species. Uh, but they're also used to um, communicate with the public uh, our findings so that they they, the volunteers themselves, can see how important their contribution has been in giving us these new insights. And that's a really important, um, but also um, positive aspect of working with data collected by the public, is that um, we can then communicate back with them um, to show them the sort of great benefits uh, that their efforts um, has has had uh, the great impact, positive impact, um, and from experience with working with the um, with volunteers over the years, is um, that uh, they do it because they um, appreciate how important it is for science uh, to collect the data. Um, and in fact, the UK is uh, one of the leading countries in terms of the engagement of the public with, uh, with such schemes. And we are very lucky uh, to be so engaged uh, with nature. So we do want to hear from you. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can join us um, using those live chat sidebars. Or if you want to tweet your question or comment, please then just use the hashtag um, Next Generation e Impact. So, Catherine, uh, I'm just going to come to you then. Um, we have been in a very strange situation for the last 18 months. Um, what impact has this had on engagement and to reaching out in the public? Yeah, it's been really, really hard. And I know with my uh, middling culture project, um, it's meant that obviously we couldn't be doing the archival work and it's made it very hard. So we do a lot of work uh, with the museum sector and we're doing a wonderful project to put together a virtual early modern room with the Weald and Downland Museum in Chichester. We haven't been able to go there. Um, but on the other hand, it has made us very creative. So we've spent a lot of time doing other things and engaging with the public virtually. So we have uh, put together a, a social status calculator. So you can find out what kind of status you would have been in early modern England and how we would know. And that's, you know, it's a piece of fun, really. Uh, but we've done a lot of that work online, on Twitter and other social media platforms. And actually that's been a, a way of engaging with a different kind of public um, and just getting people interested in the project in, in new types of ways. So there's been some, some uh, upsides and some downsides, but uh, in the other part of my job at the Institute of Cultural and Creative Industries, it's meant that the, pe the work we do with children and young people working with them very intensively around creative opportunities uh, has also had to go online. And there we've, we've tried to do work also around uh, mental health with them um, and, and working, for instance, on digital diaries so that they can share their mental health experiences because it's become increasingly important to find ways of interacting with one another. Um, so yeah, some, some of the challenges there around that uh, and the ways we've tried to address it. Okay. Thank you. Um, listen, we've got our first question in. Uh, please do keep them coming. Use those sidebars. Use the hashtag. Um, Mark, maybe I'll turn to you for this one. Uh, research, uh, engaging with the public, it can sometimes be difficult. Well, we all know that. Uh, what can we do to incentivize the public to, to listen to us? Um, well, I think one of the ways, um, and you know, to refer 
back to, to comments made earlier is to make sure that there is that element of uh, dialogue about it. So it isn't simply us saying, you know, well, we, we've built this stage, you know, we're putting these players on it and they're going to talk to you. I think if it's built around the idea of, you know, you come along and be ready to contribute and, and you know, and perhaps in advance tell us that the the kinds of things that you would like to do you would like to see happening and then you know as we unfold this program as we unfold this series we'll make sure elements like that are built into it i think that really um uh, helps because it, it, it then creates that sense of trust and partnership um and you know it, it isn't um just us saying um well you know um we know all about this subject. We know how to present it. You know, and, and here's what we, we've put together. I think that sense of ensuring that, that both sides are contributing the whole time um, really, um, it, it certainly helps build up, shall we say, a fan base and, and kind of regular loyalty, as it were. You know, people then start to become more and more confident that they, they start to put in more of their ideas. And before you know it, you, know, you have got a, a real partnership going um, and, and you are shaping things together. Well, I'll stay with you, Mark, because um, there's been an awful lot of challenges uh, engaging with the public um, during the pandemic. Uh, what's your experience? Um, yeah, we took the move to, you know, like everybody else, uh, to switch to um, online delivery for, for much of, of what we did. And of course, in certain areas that immediately boosted our uh, you know, our sense of immediacy. So certainly things like um, uh, international engagement um, crept up enormously, you know, because people could join, you know, we, we could record stuff more more easily and more effectively. It was that strange thing that, that the pandemic really you know, forced me and, and um, to, to think about a lot of the IT tools that I'd had access to for quite a while, but I just never had the chance you know, to, to play with. So I think that the, the pandemic helped in that sense of, of immediate um, contact and reach. Where I think it's actually even more challenging is now, shall we say, we're moving to a kind of grey area, what we've been talking about in terms of teaching, you know, to use that term blended. What are we going to do now we're starting to open up in some ways? How are we going to carry on with events because clear you know it's clear that there is an appetite for, for people to do things face to face that they you know they want to be in rooms or they want to be outside walking around somewhere you know with us um that, that's um how they want to engage but by the same token you know there are going to be some people who um either have uh, difficulties engaging like that and it might be the sheer practical one you know that they have become engaged because they were living hundreds of miles off and and it was only through um, a virtual platform that they could do it so i think that the real issue i say is actually probably going to be over about the next six to nine months to see how we can get the best of both worlds together. Okay, I want to develop that, that theme with uh, with you, Alex, and, and the whole idea of a post-COVID world. So um, what will engagement look like? And perhaps you could give us your thoughts both short-term and long-term. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that we are or are going to be in a post-COVID world. It's going to be with us, it's still with us now. It's rising fast as we speak. Um, I agree, with Mark, that you know, the, the way that we were forced to shift to online methods has opened up a number of possibilities um, to make it more immediate and also to put people on a bit more of an equal footing. Um, so when we were you know, previously inviting people into the halls of academia to work with us, um, that was you know, very much our space which we were inviting people into. Whereas now that we're all online, I, th I find the experience to be a more equal one because everyone's in the same format. And so some of the meetings I've had that involve members of the public, especially those that are considered vulnerable, have become more equal in their participation because people are all in the same environment when and from the same environment when they're working with each other. So I'm hoping there's things, as Mark said, that we've learned from having to work this way in the pandemic that we continue once the pandemic um, lessens. So, and I, I guess we've got that balance, Alex, of um, these virtual platforms that you mentioned that we've all become accustomed to. Now we're slowly reintroducing the in-person engagement again. Uh, what do you think about the balance to that? 
Um, I'm hoping that we can develop methods for blending both because I think there is huge value in people sharing the immediacy of the rapport that exists when you're in the same room together, when you're sharing a cup of coffee, when you have a chance to go for a drink afterwards after these events where you know things get said that wouldn't get said um, when we, we're just interacting on Zoom teams or whatever. Um, so the trick will be to balance, to, to, to continue the inclusive aspects of working online and while also having the rapport that comes from working in person. Um, Catherine, we've got one from the floor here. Um, do you think there'll be certain things that gain more importance post-pandemic? And mental health is one that's mentioned uh, in the question by the questioner specifically. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think just thinking about some of the ways that we've developed um, being in places uh, digitally, if you like, um, as, as a partial answer to that, I think in terms of creative practice, um, people have really realised how important creativity is to their mental health, but also that sense of, of being in a place, feeling at home in a place. Um, and I think there are there are many digital answers that we're starting to develop uh, that, that will help people to remain connected. I mean, I agree very strongly with Alex and Mark about the the leveling up if you like that's been possible um through digital platforms but uh, if we can find ways of of carrying that on if we can find ways of um uh, of just uh opening it up to more people i suppose and just thinking about some of the work that we're doing uh in the heritage sector you know making it possible for people to visit places have new experiences new creative experiences without having to go there. Um, you know, obviously there, there are some people for whom visiting, uh, uh, for instance, an open air museum like the Weald and Downland Museum or the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust houses who we're also working with very closely. Um, this is not possible for them either because of disability or because of geography. Uh, and I think, you know, um, the, the mental health implications of being able to do some of these things remotely will be really crucial. I want to stay with you, Catherine, because I know you've been doing a fair bit of work uh, with the Institute for Cultural and Creative Industries. Uh, now, how does this, uh, the work of this institute uh, tie in with public engagement aims? Well, I think it's partly around those questions of civic engagement that we talked a bit about later. Uh, later earlier um, but it's also uh, about some of the work that we can do now to take our uh, research around um, well across the university actually so uh, there's research going on in arts and humanities obviously and, and mark and i are doing some of that work um, but we we've also got research going on in computing um, and and di digital art uh, and then some work from uh, alex's side of the university around understanding how audiences relate to creative practices, to performances, uh, and to all sorts of exciting creative things that we might want to do. And so we can bring all of that uh, research into our communities uh, and just find out how we can make uh, an audience experience better. Um, so, so those are some of the ways in which we're doing it um, and also just involving ourselves um, with, with those local communities uh, and the kind of practice that's already going on there. So really breaking down the boundaries between what happens at the university and what happens off the campus. Uh, and we're working on Creative Kent um, as, as a way of the university showing how it can help um, our communities uh, to, to work in different creative ways. Excellent. Now, we've got a question from Emma Harrison. Emma, thank you for a fantastic question. I'm going to go to everyone with this. Uh, so I'm just reading off my screen here. Can you recommend ways of embedding a public engagement and impact agenda into the research culture of the university so that all researchers are mo motivated to build this into their research plans? So as we got you first, Catherine, let's, can you uh, tell us your views? And then I'm going to, the, to Alex and to Mark as well. Thanks. Yeah, that's a really difficult, well, it's a really fascinating question. I suppose there's lots of different types of answer to it, aren't there? Um, so one of them is about how the institution shows that it values that kind of work. Uh, and that's where, um, you know, our director of public engagement is really crucial role. Um, and just thinking about how we show from right the way through academic careers that that, that type of work is really valued. And also, um, 
uh, this kind of event, I suppose, where we show uh, and share those stories about how it increases the value of the research, how it just makes it a joy to do, um, you know, uh, to, to see the different ways in different disciplines that working with communities to, uh, to construct research projects just makes them a whole lot better. Um, so I think it's partly about um, the institutional visibility of that type of work um, and the sharing of stories, but also the way in which it's um, formally valued within the in institution, I guess. Okay. Alex, I'll come to you with that same question. I think, first of all, I'd, I'd like to put a slight caveat on what is a really fascinating question, which is I don't think we should be aiming for all academics to do public engagement. Some people are working on issues that don't necessarily need public engagement, aren't necessarily of interest to any particular public, but are still valuable nonetheless. So I don't think we should be certainly not forcing every academic to do public engagement work, but we should be encouraging, recognising and rewarding those who do want to do it. And Kathy's absolutely right, we should be making that more visible and be recognising people, not just with the attention we give them through these sort of events, but also in formal terms through getting promoted um, for public engagement. Um, quite often promotion procedures value um, research um, highly, um, especially grant income. Um, they value teaching sometimes and, you know, in public engagement maybe perhaps less. And now, uh, two or three years ago, the University of Kent revised its uh, promotion procedures and now our academic career map does include um, the possibility of being promoted for public engagement work. It should not be seen as non-promotable as it has been in the past. And Mark, what are your views on that one? Yeah, I mean, I I think one of the ways we need to think about public engagement, um, uh, and it sort of reflects my, my thinking about everything really, and, and to use that sort of ghastly overused term, um, uh, holistic. Um, I see. I've seen the amount of fun and enjoyment and enrichment that embedding things like my PhD students um, in, in these projects has had, because you know they've, they've been able to use their research instantly in new ways and, and engage with people. And, and they've really, really enjoyed that. And then that's made me think about my next evolution is to try and make sure that undergrads that I'm teaching are taking part, you know, and perhaps some of the outputs assessments that they're doing will have um, a, a kind of public engagement function so that public engagement doesn't seem like something that's done in a silo that somehow, you know, if I'm lucky, I can hook next to my research so that it becomes like a kind of thread running through everything. And at certain points, you know, it, uh, you know to come back to Alex's point, it might not be, um, it might not be apt, it might not be appropriate to follow that that element through but in other times and places it is going to be so it should always be there it should be you know, can run through my teaching what i do um uh, as part of our postgraduate community and what's happening um in, in my own immediate research so i think you know, if we start to think about it like that and and and, and it as, as, as something that we, we can embed in every part um of our work at particular um points th then it becomes actually easier to do um, because you are thinking of it, say, not as a separate thing, but as an integral thing. So we have a question for, uh, Bren from Brenda Poku about this one, and it's about a concept called patient and public involvement, uh, which seems to be uh, slightly different to, to public engagement. And Alex, maybe I could come to you for this one. Um, so PPI, patient and public involvement, has been embedded into our current research. Several evidences of good practice and challenges. Is there a similar body of evidence on public engagement, and where might we um, locate that? There is a growing body of evidence on public engagement. I mean, we've done a lot of work on PPI at the University of Kent, particularly in our Centre of Health Service Studies and our Personal Social Services Research Unit and also at the Zizard Centre. And we have staff who are dedicated to working to bring members of the public and patients into the design, the, um, the implementation and the dissemination of our research and teaching. Um, now, there's also work around public engagement in policy making. Um, I can refer, for example, to the work of Paul Kearney at the University of Stirling and at Boaz at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine have done fascinating work on how public engagement um, and policy impact interact. Um, and there's uh, Mark Reed also, his research impact handbook, for example, is quite an interesting um, approach to quite a very strategic and systematic approach to doing um, research impact which involves um, 
um, public engagement as well. So yes, there are people out there working, carrying out the research on how public engagement is done and how best it can fit, especially with the research impact agenda. This is a question I particularly like. Uh, the idea of us trying to work across disciplines a little bit more. So I'll put this one to you, Mark. Uh, if we engage in public engagement, does this help facilitate working across disciplines? I think it really does because uh, you know a lot of the stuff that I have been doing, a lot of the, the plans that I have for the future um, require um, a... A, a lot of technical assistance, and that means looking across the uh, divisions um, and, and the different research skills and teaching skills of the the university. Um, I think there's also great potential here. You know, I, I say for um, mixing our students together on it, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level, and I think that we should be looking at that um, uh, across the board as well. So. Yeah, I, I definitely see that, that there is a, a future in this, and, and you know, I think um, where we've been going in some of the um, the, the, the thinking around the, the signature research themes was was kind of helping us make those um, uh, those moves too. So I, I think that that is something that really needs to be encouraged. And the more we can have you know, for like this, where we can get together people from a broad um, uh, set of uh, disciplines and intellectual backgrounds across the university, the, the more we, we are. Making making sure that we can break out of our silos, you know, which are there and, and, and kind of inevitably get um, uh, built up because of the, the, the pressures of day-to-day of -day, um, work in the university. We've got a really nice question from, from Amy Wiggins here. Thanks for your question, Amy. This is a nice one. Um, Catherine, are there any groups of people who tend to be less likely to engage with, uh, with research or age groups, for instance, and what can be done about it? Well, I'll give you one answer to that question, and then I suspect that Alex will give you another one. And uh, um, I think um, uh, it partly pertains to what Mark was just saying there about disciplinarity as well, and, and thinking about how we engage school groups with, with some of our research. Um, and one of the things I'm doing at the moment is putting together a school's pack to understand those questions that we were talking about earlier about social mobility uh, and cultural experience in early modern England and just thinking about where that sits within a school's curriculum. So it's really hard for schools. I mean, they've got multiple challenges, particularly at the moment uh, and around the way in which they're teaching to curricula and to really clearly define differences between disciplines. And the work that we're doing uh, sits across English history, computing, tech, art, uh, business studies, all sorts of different disciplines within schools. So it becomes really hard to engage those groups in, um, in a way that, that relates uh, closely to the kind of research that we're doing, but also encourages them to make connections across the disciplines in their schoolwork. Uh, and to see that, you know, um, if, if we're studying the past, the past wasn't divided into disciplines. That's not how people live their lives. Um, so those are some challenges. On the other hand, they're a really brilliantly receptive uh, group, of course. Um, uh, we're working at the moment on Key Stage 3, and I think that's a particularly fascinating uh, period to get uh, to get students thinking. I've got kids that age myself, so I can see what happens in that shift as they go into secondary school. So that's, that's one group that's really hard to engage, not because of their own, uh, you know, uh, lack of interest, but just because it's, it's hard to find ways in there uh, or challenging, perhaps. Well, Alex, uh, Catherine has very nicely queued you up there. Briefly, if you would. So Amy's question is a great question. And the answer is yes. The audience for university's public engagement efforts does tend to be segregated by age and class. So we tend to attract an audience that is generally older and middle class and mostly graduates. And so universities need to make deliberate efforts to reach beyond their traditional audiences. And schools are a great place to do that. Um, we have a program in Kent of targeting and working with schools in the most deprived parts of Kent. And we've also got academics across the university working to bring the university's activities to the places where they are rather than expecting people to come to us. So we've got colleagues in the School of Physical Sciences who will be working from a shop front in, in Ramsgate over the next two years, Thanet being one of the most deprived parts of Kent. We've also got colleagues in the School of Architecture looking to set up spaces in Medway and Chatham where we can, bring, we can work with people in the spaces where they are. So we want to avoid 
recreating and reinforcing the inequalities that are built into university life along the lines of race, gender and class and make deliberate steps to reach beyond that. We'll take one more from the floor. This is from Livy Grant, all the way from University of Essex. Hi, Livy. I, I know for a fact she does a, a very fantastic science podcast. And each of you, just very briefly, just a couple of examples on, on the methods that you would use, uh, social media, TV, radio. Uh, Catherine, you first. Um, yes, all of those. Um, and then uh, just some of this really innovative digital methods, um, some of which we touched on before. Class calculators are really interesting one. Would never have thought of that, but research associates on the project who are younger and savvier with tech, some brilliant ideas. Uh, VR, AR, and things along those lines. Okay. Alex, anything to add to that list? That list is a good one, but we need to go beyond it, as I just said. And we often, especially in the social sciences, you hear talk of people that are hard to reach. They're not hard to reach. We know where they are. It's just a question of whether we're prepared to make the effort to go where they are. And so, for example, I've been involved in the past in participatory action research projects with people who are homeless. And it's not difficult to talk to people who are homeless. And quite often, those people are very interested in telling you about their experiences and what their needs are. And so it's just up to us to make the effort to do so. Mark, just staying with the same question briefly, if you would. Yeah, well, I, I certainly think what um, uh, COVID has taught um, us in, in our group is the enormous importance of, of podcasting. You know, that, that to me has just leapt out as a way of engaging people um, and such a flexible way as well. Um, for, um, for example, school teachers have been in touch, say it's their moment, you know, often on the bus, you know, on the way home or when they've jumped in their car to listen to something um, which is related to their work, but it's coming at them in a slightly different angle. You know, it's not another government uh, piece about um, how GCSE should work. Um, as has been um, uh, you're really um, useful for them. So um, the, you have the, the wonders of the podcast, I'm, I'm very much uh, in, interested in developing. Right. I'm going to put you all on the spot now, and I'm going to ask you all in 10 seconds, would you give us a, a, a word of advice for those early career researchers wanting to do public engagement, but not necessarily knowing where to go? Mark, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, I would start um, with something like um, the, the National Institute you know, the, for uh, Public Engagement. They've got some great ca case studies on their website, um, whatever is the disciplinary home. So you know, for me, the Arts and Humanities Research Council on their website, they've got some really great examples you know, in their reports and such like, which give a, a great uh, set of inspirational ideas for getting a project going from um, grassroots. Alex, do you want to uh, give us uh, your words of wisdom? <laughs> wisdom. Um, experience, I suppose, has taught me that public engagement and impact are not about one-off projects having particular impacts. They're about building over the long term uh, a community and relationships. So my advice to early career researchers would therefore to be find your community and build those relationships that's outside the university but is wants, wants to work with you and you want to work with them and nurture it over the long term. And we'll come to you last, Catherine. Uh, what, what's your words of advice? Yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think getting that relationship between finding your community and really challenging yourself as a researcher to think who, who would your communities be? Who would be interested in this? And what would what why would they be interested in it? Uh, and then uh, having made that as broad as possible and made those relationships challenging yourself as well along the lines Mark was saying and saying, OK, well, why can't I do that in my discipline? Looking at those other examples, you know, is there a version of that that would be a really interesting way of working with these communities? Uh, and, and just don't allow yourself to be pigeonholed in disciplinary ways, but really think, um, think in creative ways with the communities about what you can do together. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you very much to our three wise professors, Professor Catherine Richardson, Professor Alex Stevens, and Professor Mark Connolly for such a fascinating and insightful discussion. And of course, thanks to everyone at home for watching and sending through all those fantastic questions and comments. This was our penultimate Next Generation Impact Show. We'll be back with the final programme 
in the series on Thursday the 22nd of July, put that in your diary, for a special In Conversation with the Executive Chair of Research England, David Sweeney. It's moderated by Shane Weller, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and Innovation here at the University of Kent. Now for details, head to the webpage of the University of Kent's Research Excellence Team. But before we go, we're going to give you a short cl clip that's showcasing some of Catherine's fantastic work at the Weald and Downland Living Mu Museum. But for now, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you again for another exciting conversation. Goodbye. This film explores how textiles worked within early modern domestic interiors, what their visual impact was and how their original viewers might have responded to them. It is the result of a collaboration between the Weald and Down and Open Air Museum and the University of Kent and builds on the findings of a network of researchers who have worked on these questions over the last two years as part of a project called Ways of Seeing the English Domestic Interior, sponsored by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. In the course of the film, you will hear about the different kinds of evidence we have for how people lived in these houses in the past the documents about their lives and the buildings themselves, and how we can use current craft practices and digital media to explore them creatively. We hope this will give you a sense of the relationship between objects, spaces and the way people interacted with them that offers new insights into what it felt like to live in this kind of house. In this film, you will see three people Catherine Richardson, reader in Renaissance Studies at the University of Kent, Danae Tankard, social historian at the Weald and Downland Open Air Museum, and artist Melissa White. Bayleaf is a late medieval open hall house, originally from Chiddingston in Kent, moved to the museum in the late 1960s when it was facing demolition. In the late 1980s, it was furnished to create a domestic interior as it might have been around 1540. The furnishings, all of which are replica, included a woven woolen damask cloth to hang from the dais beam at the high end of the hall. After a quarter of a century on display, the cloth had faded and deteriorated to a state where it couldn't be repaired, and in 2013 a decision was made to replace it. We chose to replace the cloth with a painted one. We know that houses like Bayleaf would have had at least one and probably several painted cloths decorating their interiors. Unlike tapestries, which were only found in the houses of the wealthy, painted cloths were common even in lower status dwellings. They were mass produced and relatively cheap. However, very few painted cloths survive because of the thin and perishable nature of the material. So in choosing a design for our cloth, we turned instead to evidence from domestic wall paintings, which survive in relatively high numbers. Although many wall paintings are too fragmentary to base a design on, we were able to find a suitable scheme surviving in all three hall, a 16th century house in Flintshire, Wales. The wall paintings, located in a first floor chamber, had been dated to around 1550. In other words, close to the 1540 date that Bayleaf is interpreted to. Late medieval open hall houses like Bayleaf were laid out according to a standard domestic plan with service rooms, here the buttery and the pantry are what was considered the lower end of the house, separated from the rest of the house by a cross passage or entry. The hall was effectively divided into a lower and an upper end. The upper end was the best part of the house, its status enhanced by furnishings as well as the use of decorative timber framing such as the moulded dais beams from which the painted cloths would have hung. Here, Catherine Richardson and Danae Tankard discuss evidence for who lived in Bayleaf in the 16th century and how open halls like this one were furnished. So can you tell us a bit about the person who would have lived in a house like this? Well, we have quite good evidence for the people who were living in Bayleaf in the 16th century. and It was successive members of the Wells family. So we have Thomas Wells, then Edward Wells, and then Thomas Wells again. So throughout the whole of the 16th century, and they seem to have had a long lease, so they had sort of continuity in their tenancy. And they were yeoman farmers. They weren't particularly posh, but they were quite comfortably off, um, and that would have been reflected in their standard of living. 
So the long lease, does that mean that they had quite low rents through the period? They were able to invest more in their domestic interiors? Well, we don't know anything about their spending patterns because there's no sort of documentary evidence that will tell us about that. But yes, they were paying a fixed rent of £5, 10 shillings a year, and that stayed the same for the entire duration of the 16th century, which is how we know they Gosh. had a long tenancy. When you look at a probate inventory, which effectively is just a, is just a list of uh, mo movable items, um, they're usually itemised by room, so you get the room name, then you get the list of goods, and they show the way the appraisers move around the house, but they always start with the most important room, which of course was the hall, which is the room that we are situated in now. And the first items of furniture, which are always listed, are the table and its frame, and then you have a form or a bench, which is what we're sitting on now. Quite often, they will then move on to the hanging, and that is uh, what we see behind us. Um, and um, this was definitely the most important part of the hall, and presumably intended to sort of track the eye upwards as you sort of came into the house. So, in fact, this is this is the highlight of the room. This is where the eye is drawn, and there's some evidence, isn't there, from these documents that the people who were pricing the objects saw this as a sort of group. That appears to be the case and it is consistent in probate inventory evidence that, that it, it is always listed like this which suggests that yes they, they, they were sort of seen as the, the sort of most important items within the hall. In some houses there's evidence of um, a raised platform or a dais so you're effectively you're sitting up yeah. um, and then if you think about it, you've got these double height windows just at this end of the hall so they're illuminating this end and effectively yeah. you've got this kind of backdrop and so it it's like a stage, although again, I would sort of say it may be like a stage, but it's also this is also a pragmatic space. So yes, yeah, so in fact, this view that you're getting as we sit here yeah. um, has to define his status as yes. soon as you see it, doesn't it? And that presumably is why cloths like this are so important.